observe and record things Data from way up high As I scramble in my field pad All of a sudden I no longer feel bad Hello K-Squid listeners it's every other Sunday again. I'm Ronnie Lipschitz, and you're listening to Sustainability Now, a bi-weekly K-Squid radio show focused on environment, sustainability, and social justice in the Monterey Bay region, California, and the world. My guest today is Dr. Kirsten Wasson, adjunct professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and research coordinator at the Elkhorn Slough National Estuarine Research Reserve. Dr. Wasson has been the research coordinator at Elkhorn for over 18 years. She coordinates a comprehensive long-term monitoring program for Elkhorn Slough in which citizen scientists engage in tasks such as collecting water quality data, counting migratory shorebird birds, and tracking nesting at a heronry. She has mentored graduate students on subjects ranging from threatened red leg frogs to sea otters, from eelgrass to marshes. She is passionate about restoration of native oysters and salt marshes, both of which have suffered extensive losses in this estuary. And she conducts experiments to inform restoration strategies locally and in other wetlands. Well, Kirsten, welcome to Sustainability Now. It's good to have you here. Thank you. So um, Elkhorn Slough may not be familiar to, to, to all of our listeners. You know, we see it when we drive over the Highway 1 bridge, but it looks a bit like a river. So where is it, you know, what makes it a slough and what is an estuary? Yeah, so Elkhorn Slough is about halfway between Santa Cruz and Monterey in the middle of the Monterey Bay where the deep Monterey Canyon comes to shore. The word slough, it refers to any calm, slow moving body of water that could be fresh water or salt water. Mm -hmm. And so for us here where the ocean usually involves waves crashing on the shore and surf, it's, it's a little respite from that with calm, mm -hmm. slow moving water. Um, an estuary is where salt water and fresh water mix, or if you want to be poetic, where the river meets the sea. Mm -hmm. and, um, and how far into the slough does the salt water penetrate down? Because I know there are tides and and you know sometimes it's high sometimes it's low yeah so right now the tide is free to run all the way up the length of elkhorn slough oh, really? from the highway one bridge to where it meets elkhorn road at hudson landing um, but in a lot of other directions that tidal exchange is cut off the tide used to rise and fall in salinas in huh. castroville wow and now it does not anymore. Uh -huh. So okay. So well, why are so is the <laughs> slough uh, is the slough an estuary <laughs> or is it? I mean, is the slough the same thing as an estuary? They're not the same thing. Okay. So slough so what's just the means slough is a calm, slow-moving body of water. But you could have a slough in the middle of uh, Wisconsin or. Um, oh, okay. And, okay. And estuaries are where you have the salt water meeting the, okay. the fresh water. Well, why are estuaries important? Why don't we care about them? To me, the most important thing about the estuary is the habitat they provide to species that depend on them. So there's some species like pickleweed in the salt marsh or eelgrass or oysters that you really aren't gonna see anywhere else in California except in an estuary. So there's species that are estuary specialists. Mm -hmm. On top of that, there's other species that depend on the estuary, even though they occur in lots of places, the estuary is valuable to them. Like if you think of the sea otter, of course we have sea otters all throughout the Monterey Bay, but we have documented that the highest density of sea otter pups anywhere in the range of the Southern sea otter is in Elkhorn Slough, mm. because it's especially valuable for foraging, for resting habitat. Mm 
And then there's also sort of temporary visitors that come through, like migratory shorebirds on their thousands of miles of migration. They need places to stop and rest and eat, and estuaries provide that, that resource to them. We had volunteers out on a survey the other week that counted 23,000 uh, water birds out on the estuary wow. in one day. It's migration time. It now, is right? migration time right so, now. Yeah. And so for all these species, estuaries are important, but for one more species, for humans, estuaries are important too. For instance, supporting fisheries. There was a study showing that for fishermen catching flatfish, English sole, offshore in the Monterey Bay, a disproportionate amount spent their ju juvenile period in Elkhorn Slough, mm -hmm. and worldwide, 75% of fisheries shellfish and, and finfish fisheries, those animals spent their juvenile period in estuaries. So estuaries have this nursery function that serves humans. They have functions in terms of carbon sequestration, taking up carbon dioxide from the air, locking it up in the sediments of the salt marsh, and you know helping mitigate climate change through that. They can also improve water quality, uh, polluted runoff, can be the sediments in it and the nutrients in it can be taken up by the estuary so the, the water is cleaner when it gets to the other side. So those are those are examples of importance to humans. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, one of the things that's that's notable about the slough is is how much of it has been transformed by human action. Right. And I mean, we'll come back to that. But is the, the land there particularly fertile? Or yeah. was it full of salt? I mean, what's the, you know, was it farmed or was it, you know, used for something else? Yeah, the floodplains of rivers and estuaries are always really fertile areas right. for, for farming, um, but, but are also really valuable habitat. Well, no, I'm just thinking about the sort of will to drain marshes, right, which so conspicuous in in, uh, in Eastern England, right? Right, but also here in the United States, right? It's, it was seen for a long time as land going to waste, um, and of course that's changed a lot. Um, so, I, I always ask people how they got into this business, the business that they're in. So, you know, what is your training and background, and how did you end up in this position of research coordinator at the SLU? Yeah. So, my Professional training involved a pretty typical academic pathway of college and graduate school and a brief stint as a professor. Um, but I think what's more relevant and interesting maybe is sort of my, my personal motivations and trajectory. I grew up as a kid in a city. I grew up in L.A. and I hated the city. My parents were both from little tiny villages and rural landscapes in Arkansas and Germany, mm -hmm. respectively, and I, I fell in love with those landscapes, and mm -hmm. I was always happiest out in nature, whether it was a tide pool in Malibu or um, wading the, the creek in Arkansas or wandering the woods in Germany, and we would go to Sequoia National Park for my birthday. I didn't want to party. That's what I always wished for, mm. is to go to Sequoia, mm. and I noticed there's park rangers there that live and work out you know amongst the redwoods yeah. and i thought this is what i want to do i want a job where i can live in nature work in nature protect nature and you know but on the other hand i was also this really nerdy kid who loved to read and write and think about things and so i think my job as a conservation scientist ended up being this perfect fit for both of those interests i get to think about concepts and ask questions, but do it all in the interest of protecting this special place. Well, what do you do then as the research coordination coordinator at the SLU, at Elkhorn SLU National Estuarine Reserve, <laughs> Research Reserve, right? So you get SLU and estuary in, in both at the same time, right? That's quite a mouthful. Um, so my job is to help us understand Elkhorn SLU in ways that um, allow us to better protect and conserve it. Mm -hmm. And um, in part, that involves me and my team of staff and the volunteers who work at the reserve doing our own science. Right. We do long-term monitoring to track 
changes over time and detect you know red flags if there's some crisis going on where we need to intervene we also do short-term experiments to try to get at the processes um, what what how is a threat impacting the slew and restoration science experiments to see like how can we improve things what are the best strategies for mitigating threats but in addition to the work we do ourselves part of my coordinator title is that I work to encourage and facilitate research by others who come to the SLU. So in particular, professors and graduate students from the local universities, from Stanford, from Cal State Monterey Bay, from Moss Landing Marine Labs, and from University of California, Santa Cruz, where mm -hmm. I hold an adjunct appointment. And so I've been able to bring graduate students to the SLU that way. Yeah, I was looking at the, the papers and, and the research, and, and a lot of it is focused on specific um, marine animals right um and so you know how does that translate i mean y your research you know, was on on snails right i mean your phd no somewhere there's there, snails in there the, sorry i got that uh, yes, wrong uh, but just all sorts of things all sorts of things right <laughs> and and i mean how does that then translate to the to the ecology at large um right i, I mean there's this kind of well we read recently that 20 species have been declared extinct. Uh, things like the ivory-billed woodpecker, who no one has seen in, what, 100 years or 75 years, right? And we focus on mostly iconic species, like the otter, which right. was also almost driven to extinction. And yet, the species depend on the integration of the ecosystem, right? So how do you relate individual species, then, to, the say, the ecology of the slough? I mean, that, that to me is the ecology of the slew, is what's happening with this species. But we do focus some on the, the listed species, sea otters, and some of our amphibians, like the Santa Cruz long-toed salamander, yeah. is a, a uh -huh. focus of, of some of our work now. But I think there's another category of species that's not protected by the Environmental Species Act, um, which is species that were once dominant yeah. foundation species and now have become super rare. They're not extinct. And so salt marshes, oysters, eelgrass beds are all in this category or mm -hmm. our native coastal prairie habitat, the grasslands. Mm -hmm. They're all in this category of things that, yeah, they're still here, um, but they used to be absolutely the most common thing you'd see out there and now they're extremely rare and so a lot of my work focuses on on that kind of species the yeah. the uh -huh. um, foundation species that really make estuarine habitats what they are so how does it, well how does this foundation species work then i mean what what you know describe its role of, of a foundation species in the larger sort of ecology of the of the slough Right, so the, the whole idea is that it's one species, but whose effects reverberate through the whole ecosystem mm -hmm. by providing habitat to other species, okay. foraging opportunities, and changing ecosystem properties. Maybe that's changing the water quality or the sediment or, or the structure. And an example of that is eelgrass. Yeah, I was going to um, ask that. that my graduate student Catherine Beheshti just um, has a paper coming out in in the next weeks, documenting some of those ways that eelgrass alters um, the estuary and and provides habitat for for crabs and fish and alters the water quality, and uh, so on. Let's take a break. You're listening to KSQD 90.7 FM on your radio dial and ksquid.org streaming on the internet. Hi, you're listening to Sustainability Now. I'm Ronnie Lipschitz, and my guest today is Dr. Kirsten Wasson, adjunct professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and research coordinator at the Elkhorn Slough National Estuarine Research Reserve. Yeah, well, I, I'm just remembering that I had Jim Estes on the program last year, I can't remember exactly when, and we talked about urchins and urchin barons and how the, uh, the um, prey-predator relationships had changed up there in Alaska because of the disappearance of the urchins, right? I don't know how that affected the larger ecology of the marine environment. But, so, I mean, when, when eelgrass disappears, that that's clearly causes trouble. But what about you know, one of the, the mollusks 
you know, if a mollusk disappears, right? I mean, you're talking about oysters, you know, and I know you're doing research on oysters. If the oysters disappear, what happens? I mean, what role do they play in this? It's always hard to detect, you know, the what ifs for a single species sure, in yeah. a huge complex system that's been mm -hmm. altered in so mm -hmm. many ways, but, but certainly oyster beds are known to provide important habitat for birds, for mm -hmm. fish, yeah. um, alter the water flow, s slow water flow yeah. over their surfaces and so uh -huh. on. And so, and so they, if they, they decline or disappear, then, then these are not less available. Right. right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, is all of your work focused in this one place at the at the reserve? Pretty much, yes. So everything I do professionally, um, my research is all in this one fairly small little estuary, Elkhorn Slough. How big is it? Just uh, six miles or so along um, the the main channel of Elkhorn Slough. Uh huh. Okay. And. This is very different as an academic, which I did formerly, you are grounded in a topic and you maybe yeah. study that topic in a lot of different places right, and systems, right. but your depth is in that topic. Right. And now I have a huge breadth of topics that yeah. I know a little bit about water quality and shorebirds and oysters and otters and so on, but my depth is in this one place. And so I'm grounded in this one place. And I, I love that kind of place-based research, but one thing I wanted to point out is that even for, for those of us who just work in one small place, it's really powerful to hook up with other people working in networks of similar places. And right, I think this true. is true for professionals in all sorts of fields, not just mine, that these communities of practice mm -hmm, can be mm -hmm. really powerful where you have lots of place-based people, you know, thinking together about what are the lessons learned from each other, what commonalities can we find? And I wanted to give like three examples of that sort okay. of community of practice. Great. One is um, the Nook Native Olympia Oyster Collaborative, mm -hmm. which I helped found a few years ago to connect everyone working on native oysters from Baja, um, California, all the way up to British Columbia. Mm. And we do a lot together. Mm -hmm. Another example. I, I assume these are different species of oysters. It's one oyster. It's one oyster. One oyster. Oh, the Olympia oyster from, is the... from the middle of oh, Baja wow. up through oh, the no... top of British Columbia. Oh, wow. okay. There's a single native oyster species, Austria lurida. Uh huh. Okay. Sorry. No, You're sure. And then another example of a network, I nominated Elkhorn Slough to be a part of the Ramsar Convention. Mm -hmm. Um, in 2018, and we got that designation. Maybe you should explain and, what that and is. And that's um, one of the world's first global environmental treaties mm -hmm. was signed in Ramsar, Iran. It sounds like an acronym, Ramsar, but it's yes, actually a place. <laughs> it's Ramsar, Iran. Yeah, yeah. And um, it was um, to protect the world's wetlands. Right. Yeah. And now Elkhorn Slough is part of this worldwide network, sort of a commitment of nations around the world to protecting their wetlands. Do you know when that agreement first came in? 1971. Into okay, so it's it's not Right at the beginning yeah, of the environment. Okay, interesting, but, yeah. but Elkhorn was designated in Probably in couldn't 2018. do it today, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the third network is the most obvious one, given my my job title, is that I'm part of the National Estuarine Research Reserve Network. It must be hard, though, to keep up with all of the research. <laughs> right? I mean, that That's could, true for everyone. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting, you know, the, the way that you made that distinction between sort of, you know, depth of topic and then sort of breath of place. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I mean, there's yeah. a real sense abroad that place is extraordinarily important and that, you know, they differ amongst each other. They have similar features and yet there are these, these differences, right? And doing yes. comparative work is, is probably quite interesting. Exactly. So my colleague who has my position at the National Estuarine Reserve in Narragansett Bay, Rhode Island, and I uh -huh. spearheaded an assessment of how resilient are our salt marshes to sea level rise. Uh 
across yeah. 15 of these national estuarine reserves and there's just huge contrast some are very resilient some aren't and looking at you know there's some regional patterns some just apples and oranges and but but they're all at sea level so why would they why would some <laughs> be more resilient than others what's the they're not the all at the same elevation so one of the oh, really? resilience yeah. traits we looked at is how how high are you now relative to water level we also uh -huh. looked at how fast are you building elevation ones that have you know a good uh, upward trajectory uh -huh, are uh -huh. uh, like the red queen you know staying a little bit ahead mm -hmm. we looked at sediment supply which is what helps you <laughs> attract sea level rise we looked at tidal range which plays a bit more of a complicated role yeah. but we looked at multiple factors that that can give you resilience to sea level rise and what did you conclude <laughs> 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 or have you gotten that far uh, we have, but mostly our conclusion was that there's a few places that are in a lot of trouble that need action now, while yeah. there's others that are doing fine, and that we should tailor our management strategies right. around yeah. that knowledge. The ones that are very resilient, we need to make sure those lands are protected, you know, buy them up and protect them if they're not in good right. conservation hands. Right. The ones that are in trouble, we need to intervene and help them. And where does Elkhorn Slough fall in to yeah. this? In trouble. In trouble. In trouble. <laughs> yeah. mm. um, uh, well, just to just to move for one one second, what what is a natural estuarine research reserve? So there's more than one, right? right? So so how did they come into being? What do, what does it mean? Yeah. So it was the Coastal Zone Management Act mm -hmm. that um, founded the National Estuarine Research Reserve System as a place where estuaries could both be protected and studied. Both yeah, of those yeah. are sort of part of the charter. And um, the NERS are a partnership between NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and a different state agency in every case. Because unlike, say, the National Marine Sanctuaries that are purely NOAA, yeah. estuaries are at the boundary of land and sea. The, the terrestrial right. watershed side really right. matters. And right. so you need the state agencies involved too. And in our case, it's the California Department of Fish and Wildlife that is our state partner and that owns and operates the Elkhorn Slough Reserve. And they, in turn, have partnership by the Elkhorn Slough Foundation, a nonprofit land trust in the watershed. And then there's still many other partners. Part of Elkhorn Slough is part of the National Marine Sanctuary, the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. The Nature Conservancy has been heavily involved. And mm -hmm. I think that sort of a, a take home lesson for conservation of estuaries is that it always takes these diverse partnerships to come together to protect them. I want to ask a social science question. You might yeah. not be able to answer it, but it's one that's long intrigued me. So, I mean, the Department of Fish and Wildlife was set up probably a hundred years ago, right, to conserve species, which meant to regulate hunting and taking, right? So you need a fishing license or a hunting license, right? So, so these agencies are basically not for the protection per se or of 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 animal life and, and fish right but to regulate the taking and and we know from experience that usually the taking exceeds the reproductive capacity of the animals i mean is, has this particular department sort of changed its call it its weltanschauung <laughs> as far as you can tell or is it still being governed by that older no i mean view? i think even from the get-go the idea of hunting and fishing um, resource management is that you want it to be sustainable and you want the habitats that those species live in to be protected you can't just have you know waterfowl out in the streets of san francisco you need wetlands where you can hunt them and so that there's always been a pretty close link between habitat protection and um, sustain it, aiming for some sort of sustainability. Mm -hmm. But I also think um, the resource management agencies like CDFW have evolved with, with society and over time, and there's now much more emphasis on biodiversity protection for mm -hmm. its own sake, um, in addition to continuing to, to serve the, the hunting and fishing aspects. When people cross the slough at Highway 1, I mean, they see the harbor, they see the power plant, and they, they see some kayakers, right? Um, I actually look, always look to see how high the water is. 
um, and I don't know why. <laughs> but uh, across the the the, um, the road, you've got these channels, right, right in the right, marshland, right. and I'm always Absolutely. sort of fascinated by it's by super those. Super dynamic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it's evident that they they took a lot of uh, working over by humans in the last 150 years, I guess. So what what was the slough being used for? What was the you know utility of the slough because that's how people looked at it for sure yeah i mean backing up estuaries globally are considered the most altered ecosystems on earth mm -hmm. they're um, often in these fertile flood plains that were centers of human population for thousands of years if you picture the nile river delta for yeah, instance well, you know right. Um, and they also have long been used as harbors because right. they have the protected waters for boats and centers for aquaculture because they're a great place to, to raise shellfish and so on. And, and so Elkhorn Slough is no exception. It fits in that theme. It lies in this really protective farmland. I'm sure your listeners have eaten strawberries or lettuce that came from farm fields right adjacent to Elkhorn Slough. Yeah. And we're all, you know, grateful for that produce. But there has been a downside for the estuary of the impact of agriculture in particular. The estuary used to be huge. It was called Estero Grande on mm -hmm. some of the early maps, mm -hmm. and it had lots of interconnected arms. Right. Not just the main one we're familiar with today, but lots of interconnected arms and a huge tidal prism. The, the tide rose and fell in Castroville and Salinas, if you can sort of so picture that, flat, that right? huge yeah. network. And gradually, each of those arms of the estuary were amputated. The, the tidal mm -hmm. exchange was cut off from them by berms, by dikes, by tide gates. And at the same time, the freshwater was um, used for irrigation and groundwater dried up and, and rivers were diverted. Mm. And so mm. you asked what the definition of an estuary was, a mixing of tidal water and freshwater, both of those, the, the fundamental plumbing of the estuary was altered. And so, if we look back at historical records, my colleague Andrea Woolfolk has done a lot of sleuthing and has descriptions of these channels, Templadero Slough, Castroville Slough, the old Salinas River that used to be full of waterfowl and ringed by salt marsh and have deep channels with fish jumping in them. Now a lot of those places, if you looked at them today, would look like ag ditches. In fact, one of them's called the uh, Salinas Reclamation Ditch. Um, it, so it, they they a, weren't actually filled in, they were just it, sort of dried out. Right? More that they were dried out yeah. and cut off. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes people ask me, you know, why am I looking backwards? Why do I look to the past and, and look at these maps? But I actually think it's critical as a conservation scientist because it helps us to dream big. If we only looked at what's here today, for Elkhorn Slough, for people who've kayaked in it, there's a really thriving rich part in the lower half of one of the arms, the five historic arms of the estuary, and we definitely want to take care of that. Um, but if we look at the maps from the 1800s and see the Estero Grande, we see this you know, far grander estuary, uh, twice the size that it is that it is now and i think that's what we want to bring back let's mm -hmm. let's watch sea otters forage oyster beds form and kayakers enjoy all the other arms of the estuary too so the past helps us envision a better future yeah well okay <laughs> all right, um, resuming so you know so so what else went on there I, you've got all of these sort of flat areas with little berms between them right Sometimes there's water in them, sometimes they're dry. What was going on there? That's on the, what, on the east side of the highway, right? Is the, the northeast side of the highway. Yeah. Uh, what was that? So those were used as salt ponds Okay. Um, to, to harvest salt. Um, like back, in, the, in the bay. Right, like the exactly. Salt ponds in the bay. Okay. And now they are being managed for the benefit of snowy plovers. 
uh -huh. which have a hard time finding nesting areas on our beaches because people's dogs and kids yeah. are running around there and no one could really get into the salt ponds. And so while it's not exactly a natural habitat type for them, it provides some refuge from predators. And um, for a while, while the species is getting through a bottleneck, it makes sense to manage a I former see. salt marsh that way. Ultimately, okay. I would love to see that area restored to, mm -hmm. to salt marsh, but right now it's serving a, a species that's having a hard time. Let's take a break. You're listening to KSQD 90.7 FM on your radio dial and ksquid.org streaming on the internet. Hi, you're listening to Sustainability Now. I'm Ronnie Lipschitz, and my guest today is Dr. Kirsten Wasson, adjunct professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and research coordinator at the Elkhorn Slough National Estuarine Research Reserve. Well, so since you, you mentioned restoration, you, you and your colleagues are engaged in the restoration of Hester Marsh, and I didn't actually look up to see where that is, but uh, what does it entail and why are you doing it? Yeah, so Hester Marsh is about a third of the way from the Highway 1 bridge to the top of the slough uh -huh. on the southern side of the estuary. And it's a marsh where we're trying to undo some of this damage from diking that occurred in the past mm -hmm. while keeping an eye on the future and, and looking ahead to climate change. So it was an area that was diked, cut off from tides, and during that time, the sediments shrunk. If you picture your kitchen sponge, how it gets skinny mm -hmm. when it's dried, um, wetland sediments can, can become compacted. And so tidal exchange was returned, was restored, but the marshes that used to be there didn't come back because it was too low. It had sunk so much during the diked period, which is true throughout the estuary, that you have this ghost of past diking of these subsided low uh -huh. marshes. And the reserve um, bought a fallow farm that uh -huh. was adjacent to this marsh uh -huh. and hadn't been farmed because the well had gone salty due to groundwater overdraft. And um, so this farm became part of the reserve. And what we did is we used soil from the farm and scraped it into the wetland and raised the elevation back up to a level that would be high enough for marsh to grow. Mm -hmm. But we didn't stop there. We raised it even higher to be the highest marsh in Elkhorn Slough. Mm -hmm. And the thought there was that most of our marshes are very low and our modeling suggests that with just a few feet of sea level rise they will be submerged and disappear but this hundred acre marsh restoration site will be the last marsh standing mm -hmm. in elkhorn slough and also by contouring the land and scraping it we made a gradual slope with sort of a migration pathway where the marsh can then migrate upland oh. too huh. and so it's it's a sort of pioneering example of proactively building your marsh for tomorrow and I mean a, a downside in the short term is by building it so high it's colonizing with vegetation less slowly because tides come up there less often bringing seeds less often and making it drier than some marshes and um, but we think that trade-off is worth it because um, in 50 years, it'll, it'll be the only one there. So this is a place I spend a lot of time out there in the marsh, um, tracking how the plants are coming. It's like a natural lab for mm -hmm. marsh assembly. And I'm out there with students and volunteers and colleagues uh, trying to understand what's going to happen. And my, one of my heroes is a wetland scientist named Joy Zedler, who challenged restoration practitioners to make their work more experimental because restoration is kind of an experiment all along. Right, I mean, right. a lot of the time we're, we're innovating how to bring the system back and don't really know the best method. And so why not take advantage of that by doing some replicated experiments so you mm -hmm. can learn from your site and manage your site better, but also share that knowledge with, with others working in similar systems. And that's something we at the reserve really take to heart and have a dozen different experiments going going on out there. Is that kind of work going on at other estuary? estuarine reserves too or is it yes are you pioneering this stuff? <laughs> um 
I'd say the climate resilience restoration that we're doing at this scale is fairly unusual, but all of the National Estuary and Research Reserves are doing some sort of science and restoration component, and, and sometimes it's opposite problems. Our sister reserve at Tijuana River down near the Mexico border at the southern end of, of San Diego they have too much elevation from sediment that comes off the Tijuana watershed uh -huh. during heavy rainfall yeah. and their marshes get buried in many feet of sediment yeah. and yeah. so you know they, they have problems with with too much too high elevation and too much sediment mm -hmm. we have the opposite problem so everybody's sort of grappling with their own issue but that's a an active uh water flow system right i mean since there's a river yeah. Right, as opposed to, to, to Elkhorn Slough, which is getting runoff, basically, right? Water runoff and not, not water from farther up. It's um, true. The, the Salinas River was the main freshwater source for yeah. Elkhorn Slough, but its opening varied. Sometimes it flowed into Elkhorn Slough and sometimes it didn't. Sort of typical for Mediterranean climate. Uh, in big okay. El Nino years we probably would have gotten you know Much a bunch more. of water and sediment but right. in drought years we didn't. There's yeah. also a creek, Carneros Creek, that mm -hmm. runs into the estuary at the head. Mm -hmm. But our, our historical maps also suggest a really important role for groundwater that mm -hmm. we had little uh, pockets of tulies and cattails all around the marsh in areas where there were freshwater seeps. Got it. And yeah. there's, there's historical records of people going and filling their water bottles with fresh water, you know, at, right at the edge of the marsh in these places. So there were all these freshwater seeps. They were good for amphibians and all. And because of groundwater overdraft, that, that, water, yeah. that water has disappeared. Yeah. And I mean, that's where looking to the future, estuaries need land and water just like humans do. Like, I know wars are fought about land and water. These are the things, yeah. you know, we, we have battles about, but it's really important to remember that estuaries need to be at that table too, mm -hmm. because what they depend on to have the rich habitats and species is the, the water the and, of, and, and yeah. the land to yeah. occupy. Yeah. Um, you were talking about the, the, the marsh migrating upwards right and i mean does that mean that the the species would be doing the moving as the water goes up higher than the species move along with it is that the i mean it's not just simply water rising that uh, it, does it exactly okay. yeah the the marsh is really finely tailored to the water levels so that when we have a high water event during the marine heat wave in 2014 water levels were 10 centimeters higher than usual mm -hmm. and the bottom of the marsh died and the top moved up a bit wow. and so it's you know it's really exactly in the elevation um, the bottom it can't be inundated too much of the time or it doesn't get enough the roots don't get enough oxygen Oxygen's the yeah. top it needs some king tide to wet it sometimes yeah. and that very much brackets where mm -hmm. salt marsh can mm -hmm. occur mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well um is climate change the biggest threat to elkhorn slough so i would say not this decade and probably not next decade either um and I want to be very clear, you know, for listeners that I absolutely think climate change is the big problem of our generation that must be tackled right now today, you yeah. know, through policy, yeah. through through individual actions, because it is going to pose an enormous threat to all ecosystems. So just, you know, being clear that, that globally climate change, absolutely critical. But for relatively pristine ecosystems like Monterey Bay, it may already be moving into the sort of number one threat level mm -hmm. because a slight change in pH or temperature can, you know, have a big difference for, right. for organisms there. But for systems like Elkhorn Slough, climate change is not in our top three, maybe not in our top 10 really? threats right now. And that's because the effects are subtle and we've had these very not subtle <laughs> effects um, on it. So as we were just talking about, we have parts of the estuary that are now farm fields. Right. 
that's a really big whole scale change mm -hmm. that totally alters the habitat, the species, the function yeah. to change an estuary to a farm field. We have areas where the nutrient concentrations are two or three orders of magnitude higher now than they would be in a natural system. This is nitrates mostly, yeah, right? Yeah, nitrates, also pesticides and, oh, and yeah, other things, yeah. but the nitrates are important because they overstimulate production and then lead to low oxygen conditions right. at night, yeah. which have made around 50% of the historic estuary, this part that's, that's choked off from natural tidal exchange, uninhabitable for most mm -hmm. fish mm -hmm. and animals and, and eelgrass and so on. And again, this is just like a huge shift to take an area that used to have hundreds of species and thriving um, ecosystem and turn it into something that's basically an ag ditch. Yeah. And so slight changes to pH or slight changes to temperature are just so subtle on that, that backdrop. So to make Elkhorn Slough healthy again, to turn it into this grand estuary that it once was to bring back the 50% we lost, it's local controversial issues of land and water that we need to address, um, not, not global climate change right now, even though of course we all should be addressing global climate change. So, so what are those local issues specifically? I mean, I mentioned nitrates, but... Right. Um, yeah. So the the three biggest threats and how to reverse them number one threat is this that we've amputated the arms of the estuary right. and we need to allow tidal exchange to return and the fresh water um, through through groundwater restoration so are these arms privately owned the lands adjacent to them are and so there so are farmlands that would we would need to have some managed retreat of okay. farmlands okay. to allow the estuary to reoccupy those areas. Mm -hmm, and that's mm -hmm. why it's a hard conversation because sure. people's living depend on it. People's wells are nearby. Um, it's not something you would just do overnight. You would have right. to do it in a planned and thoughtful way to ensure that, you know, the concept of sort of managed retreat of moving back out of the way of the sea, we're going to have to do that with sea level rise, but just also for returning the, the estuary to where it once was, we need to sort of back up from that. But conservation organizations can help, local governments can help. Yeah. So there's yeah. that. Um, so, so that is what I see as by far the biggest threat to the estuary. The biggest change is this um, cutting off the tidal exchange and decreasing the freshwater. So changes to the plumbing that need to get fixed in arms like Moro Coho, Bennett Slough, Porter Marsh, and so on. Um, nutrient pollution, I would put as the, the number two, or mm -hmm. pollution in general. And efforts are certainly underway and that have made a big difference already, moved the needle. The Elkhorn Slough Foundation is now the biggest landowner in the watershed, so mm -hmm. our nonprofit partner that mm -hmm. the reserve works with, and they've put into place much more sustainable farm practices on the farms they've bought and the steepest land they take out of production and restore to natural habitat. Um, and we've measured in our water monitoring data downstream improvements, direct improvements to water quality under areas that have been restored. Mm -hmm. There's also treatment wetlands mm -hmm. that have been put in place in between farm fields and, and estuaries to improve the water quality. But it's still an area where public pressure on um, government officials and regulators, plus incentives to just buy sustainably produced um, things at farmers markets and so on, in, in a lot of ways we can still do a lot better there. And yeah, then the third yeah. big factor is invasive species. Mm, okay. So in a lot of parts of the estuary, it can be hard to even see a native species. That's true of our coastal prairies, they're dominated by non-natives. It's true of our marine invertebrate communities. And it's really hard to, to um, do a lot about species that are already there, but we can all work at prevention. So not buying plants from a nursery like a rondo or pampas grass um, that can get out of control yeah, and, and yeah. take off in, in an estuarine habitat. Um, 
and as a part of restoration when we do have a clean slate to work with, the, the scraped farmlands, we can bring back prairie, bring back native marshes. Let's take a break. You're listening to KSQD 90.7 FM on your radio dial and ksquid.org streaming on the internet. Hi, you're listening to Sustainability Now. I'm Ronnie Lipschitz, and my guest today is Dr. Kirsten Wasson, adjunct professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and research coordinator at the Elkhorn Slough National Estuarine Research Reserve. Do you do, you do try to do any removal of of these invasive species? Yeah, so in a very targeted way because there's too many that we can't, you know, fight every battle, but the ones that have the biggest negative impacts on native species, um, we work to um, remove and do native restoration in those places instead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How how are you trying to restore the oyster population in the sloop? It is a big challenge because oysters have almost entirely disappeared from Elkhorn Slough. They were present in every native American midden from different times and places around the slough for many thousand years. And they were still common when Europeans first recorded them here. Um, But now they're at risk of completely disappearing. And just sort of backing up, this is a global issue. Oyster reefs are at risk around the world, and they've actually been decimated more than coral reefs. But coral reefs, I think, get more attention because they're They're prettier. They're prettier, they're bright and beautiful, while oyster uh, beds are are muddy and gray. Mm -hmm. And also, oyster reefs were mostly uh, gone already before our lifetime, while while we're losing coral reefs sort of before our very eyes. So speaking of that, I would bet that virtually none of your listeners today have ever seen or touched a native oyster on this coast or eaten one. Well, I don't eat oysters as a rule, but I certainly (laughs) haven't seen or touched an Olympia oyster, no. Well, we're... We're going to have to get you out to Elkhorn Slough, and that just reminds me to to say we have a visitor center and trails that are open to the public uh, Wednesday through Sunday, and and we'd love to have any of your listeners out to come see the reserve. To see an oyster, you have to be out at a pretty low tide, but they're Mm -hmm. out there. Um, But in any case... um, Our oysters are in trouble, and we're hoping to change that. We're engaging the community in rebuilding oyster populations at Elkhorn Slough, but because the population is so tiny, we're using aquaculture Mm -hmm. to rebuild it. So we're growing oyster babies at Moss Landing Marine Labs and then putting them out in the estuary. Our current population in the estuary is a few hundred, and my hope is to bring that population up to a million, and then I think it'll be self-sustaining. Do you just release the babies into the water, or do you have some sort of protected area in which you release them? No, we... So oysters as larvae undergo metamorphosis and settle, cement themselves permanently to a hard... um, material and so we provide that material in the form of clam shells Uh, the sea otters eat a lot of clams in the slough and then shells wash up on the beach so Uh that seems like a nice natural Mm -hmm. uh, material to bring into Mm -hmm. the lab Mm -hmm. and so we hang like these mobiles of clam shells in their tanks with the larvae so that the larvae can settle on the clam shells and then the clamshells, which we have pre-drilled with holes, and then we um, tie little clusters of clamshells to stakes and put those out in the estuary oh, okay. to sort of okay. mimic the structure of a natural reef, which is no, I, I misunderstood that. Yeah. So you're, you've got the larvae... Settled the already. And then they're so all, it's, okay, it's juveniles it. that we yeah. bring out when they're maybe dime-sized mm-hmm. um, little baby oysters. Then, mm-hmm. we, then we bring them out to the estuary mm-hmm. to grow there. Uh, just just last question how, how much compared to the historical number of oysters in the slough how much is a million i wish we knew that's something that it's really hard to get baselines from so we have the old maps from spanish explorers that yeah. tell us how much salt marsh we had but there's not really any record of how many oysters we had. All I can say is that if they were showing up in the sort of dinner piles of Native Americans, they must have been more abundant than they are now because sure. you could spend your entire 
low tide out looking for oysters and not come up with enough for a bowl of soup today. So you know. I know we have less, but I don't know. Yeah, but I don't you don't know, know whether many. it's a billion right. or, or, or what. Yeah. So my goal okay. is just to, to bring back enough for the population to be self-sustaining. Are they concentrated in one part of the slough or are you... Um, planting them all over the place. We're focusing on the reserve. That's where most of them are today, mm -hmm. um, sort of the upper estuary. The larvae are prone to getting washed out to sea if they're cl too close to the mouth. Yeah, And sure. so we want it in places where the water is retained okay. longer. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, you've been working with um, Native Americans, local communities, on restoration projects at, in the slough. Can you tell us something about those? It's a very new endeavor that's just starting um, for myself, for the reserve, but one we're really excited about. So earlier I talked about looking to the past in terms of looking at maps from the 1800s, but of course indigenous people have lived here for 10,000 years and um, long before the European colonists came and started building these dikes and such that have the strong impact on the estuary and, and forced Native Americans from their ancestral lands. So today, members of various Native American tribes that lived around Elkhorn Slough are trying to reconnect mm -hmm. with this area. And we have a grant from the Ocean Protection Council um, to partner with the Amamutsun in our native oyster restoration work oh, okay. and um, it'll be you know a partnership where what we provide is some um, training on how oysters are monitored and restored and um, giving the young native stewards some experience with a species that you know their ancestors had experience with but they may not have um, and what we gain from it is learning from their perspectives on sustainable stewardship of culp uh, of marine resources and their spiritual connection to, mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. these resources. Mm -hmm. We have another grant where we're going to work with tribal elders from various groups at mm -hmm. Morro Bay, Elkhorn, and Tamales uh -huh. and try to envision what their hope is for a reconnection to some of these shellfish in the estuaries and exploring whether aquaculture might be a tool by which they could then have sustainable harvest and mm -hmm. and go back to eating some of the foods that their ancestors did. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, uh, so these are all pretty long-term projects, right? Um, do you think you'll still be working at the slough in, in 25 years? I think that's, I mean, I'm not going to ask how old you are, but, but I think that's sort of a fair period. Yeah, I, I certainly hope so. I hope I'm still um, out there doing work yeah. in my 80s. Yeah. I would like to be around to see millions of oysters in Elkhorn Slough with water quality so improved that it's safe for Native Americans to harvest and eat them. I would like to be out there on Hester Marsh, pushing my walker around along the uh, permanent transects and seeing the marsh, you know, <laughs> thriving. Yeah. And I would love to see the, the stagnant arms of the estuary once again flushed by mm -hmm. clean tidal mm -hmm. and, and fresh water and reconnected to the big estuary network they were once a part of. This is my dream job and I will keep at it in one form or another as long as I'm able. To, to any of your listeners who may be early in their career and, and thinking about what they want to do, I'd like to give you this advice based on my own experience. Follow your heart and find a career where you can put all your energy and wisdom into doing what you believe in whether that's making the world a better place or answering intriguing questions or creating beauty. You only have this one chance, this one life, and I have found such joy and fulfillment following a pathway where I feel that every day I'm learning something that will in some little way help Elkhorn Slough to recover and thrive. As uh, the poet Mary Oliver wrote, I challenge your listeners to tell me what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? <laughs>
Well, that seems like a good place to, to end the conversation. So thank you so much, Kristen, for being on Sustainability Now. You're welcome. It was fun talking to you about my, my favorite place. You can find out more about Dr. Wasson's research at wasson.eeb.ucsc.edu and about the Elkhorn Slough at www.elkhornslough.org backslash E-S-N-E-R-R backslash. I encourage you to go out there and visit. It's a wonderful place. As a reminder, shows from the 5 to 6 p.m. Sunday slot are rebroadcast the following Tuesday mornings from 6 to 7 a.m. If you'd like to listen to previous shows, you can find them at ksqd.org backslash sustainability now and Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Pocket Casts, among other podcast sites. Thanks for listening, and thanks to all the staff and volunteers who make K-Squid your community radio station, including Emily Dunham, who is engineer for this show. And so, until next every other Sunday, sustainability now. Because giving knowledge to the world is what I, what I want to do. Making everyone more aware of brackish water zone, geomorphic hydrodynamics. This is my dream. I'm in an airplane flying again.